Welcome into the Bet the Board pregame show, ladies and gentlemen. I am your host, Todd Furman, joined as always by my esteemed colleague and co-host, the one, the only pain insider. How goes it this afternoon, my good man? You have hit the middle of the season wall. Guy comes oh. out in a t-shirt, no backdrop. Here we are. You know what? I couldn't handle the abuse that I took from all of our loyal listeners and viewers. Had to send the backdrop off to the dry cleaner, figure out exactly what needed to get done, bust out the iron. You know, I tried to call up your housekeeper to see if she could come out here and help clean things up a little bit for me. To no avail. So here we are with the original <laughs> backdrop. Maybe if you're lucky, I'll bring back good old orange next week for you. There you go. I figured, you know, you're a guy who's organized all the time. You would have been able to figure out how to get that cleaned and returned in time for the show. Yeah, I'm not, I never claim to be the smartest one around here. I'm not the operations manager. Everyone who's watched us or listened to us over the years know that you do all the heavy lifting. I show up, I flip my mic on, I try not to say something stupid, and then uh, I ride off into the darkness. So that's how this works. That's why this company's been it. as successful as it's been. All right, like we start every single show for those folks watching the Bet the Board pregame show for the first time as you see a rundown on the right hand side all the topics we'll get to in some capacity if you happen to hear a bell at any point it means the two of us have been rambling way too long about five to six minutes thereabouts we like to keep it moving we like to cover as much real estate as we possibly can and we always kick things off pain with me asking you what are you looking forward to the most this coming football weekend okay what i'm looking forward to most is giving away more of our money to our loyal listeners we're gonna do right, another little contest there. This one's going to be skill-based, and let's not screw the pooch here. Listen carefully. <laughs> Place a three-team parlay in the comment section. Can be NFL, can be college football, can be a mix of both. Has to be against the spread. One of the parlay legs has to be a total. That's it. Post it in the comment section. The winner, 200 bucks cash. Now, we will do this because I'm sure there's going to be multiple winners. Whoever posts first, and we'll see the timestamp, will be the winner. But that's that's it. Easy peasy. Three-team parlay can be a mix of NFL or college football, all of each. But one of the legs must be a total, has to be against the spread. That's it. Simple. All right. That's what I was going to ask. I mean, you at least covered the last caveat there because I know we have some loyal listeners that would have been jokers taking, you know, minus 1,200 for two of their legs on a little money line action to try and mix things up. So as Payne said, against the spread, one leg's got to be a total. We love giving away money around these parts. It's a sign of our appreciation for everything that you guys have done for us, whether you're with us for the first time or you've been with us from day one. And as always, encourage you guys looking for more long-form content. Go to your favorite podcast platform. Subscribe to the Bet the Board podcast. Five-star reviews, always welcome. And you'll get fresh episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday throughout the course of the football season. All right, so you told us about the contest, and if that's what you're looking forward to most, can I say I'm looking to see if your Florida State Seminoles can actually play 60 minutes and win a marquee game after uh, the unfortunate circumstances with which anyone holding a plus nine and a half ticket went by the wayside last weekend against Clemson? Well, you could have got above the 10 early in the week. Yes, I realize. No, we're not going we're, we're to... We're not going to throw salt in the wounds if you took nine and a half. I really thought they had a chance to win that game. Now, they didn't deserve to, right? If you look at the win probability after the game, they were outplayed just kind of how I thought they would. The offensive line just isn't good enough in a matchup like that. Clemson still has a top five defense in the country, so you can't get the ground game going. It's not much of a pass team. None of their receivers are good enough to consistently beat man coverage, so not shocking. However, all of a sudden, you get the strip six, and you're up three late and you're saying oh my god let's hold on here some interesting calls late some phantom pass interference calls didn't love seeing that that would have been a great game to steal especially six weeks out from a lot of kids committing making their official pledge so that was a tough loss for florida state this week though nc state are they going to be able to run the ball against nc state and that is the big question because i'm not sure they certainly don't have the advantage in the trenches and again jordan travis has improved as a passer but not someone that's going to consistently sit back in the pocket, pick you apart, especially with that receiver group. So while the line says Florida State, I can't quite get there myself. There's also a little flu bug, a flu bug rolling through the team this week. 
Never a great state of affairs. I may have to get your take. You know, if we get another lousy college football slate sometime over the next three or four weeks to try and have you go through a pecking order in terms of which program's trajectory you like the best, whether it's UF, whether it's Miami or Florida State, to get your unbiased opinion for three teams that we all would love to see return to the top of the college football food chain. But that's a different topic for a different day. And let's get into your beloved NFL to kick things off. And we can start with the showdown Mahomes? in the no, we're not talking about Mahomes. Oh, we, we, no, okay. we've talked about Mahomes every single podcast. I feel like every <laughs> single week they're a part of this. No Patrick Mahomes talk. This is a Patrick Mahomes free zone for the next 30 to 35 minutes. Instead, we're going to talk about another quarterback that's underwhelming so far this season. See what I did there? <laughs> in the form of Baker Mayfield, who finds himself installed as an underdog against the Cincinnati Bengals for the first time at the helm of the Cleveland Browns. It's the Bengals, a modest two and a half point favorite and the FanDuel Sportsbook app. You're looking at a total hovering in the high 40s. Both teams coming into this game paying off very disappointing losses in different styles. Cleveland coming up short, getting suffocated by that Pittsburgh Steelers defense in their own building. Cincinnati becoming the first double digit favorite this National Football League season to lose outright against the much maligned Jets. Are the Browns going to be able to run the football this week? And more importantly, I guess on the other side, can the Bengals keep Joe Burrow upright against that ferocious pass rush of Cleveland led by Miles Garrett? Those are the big questions. And, you know, it's 2021 and you're like, can the team run the ball? It feels so old school, but that's just how Cleveland's built. They have to be able to run the football. And right now you've had a bunch of linemen in and out of the lineup. You had some of your depth leave in the offseason, some injuries, some guys departing. You've had running backs injured. You're going to be without Conklin this week. You're without Kareem Hunt again. So they have to figure out how to get the ground game going consistently. And hopefully that makes Baker Mayfield's life a little bit easier because we know, I think, at this point that he is not the drop back guy to read a defense, to get the ball out on time accurately and deliver it with precision. That's just not him. He's got to be able to throw the ball with play action. He's got to be able to get the screen game going. And right now, if you can't run the ball, Suddenly, the screen isn't effective on, on third and 10, third and eight, third and seven. The play action game from under center isn't there on third and nine, third and 10. So they have to be able to run the ball to get those things going. And the Bengals just got drubbed by that similar system last week, right? Mike White, 79% play action rate last week through 20 balls to running backs on screen. So I think that's what you're looking for offensively. You mentioned the other side of the ball. The key is pressure. It's always pressure against Joe Burrow based on that offensive line until it gets retooled, especially up the middle. And you have a Browns defense right now uh, that is top five in pressure rate despite not blitzing a lot. So can they get to Joe Burrow? That'll be the big question mark there. Looks like Denzel Ward is trending in the right direction as well in the secondary, so that should help things. But basically what you're having right now is a Bengals offense that isn't running the ball overly efficiently. The Browns defense does a good job stopping the run. So it's basically Joe Burrow sitting there in shotgun. And if you can get pressure, suddenly explosive pass game goes away because he's got to throw short to evade the pressure. That'll be the key here. This line was three earlier in the week. Despite all of the turmoil going on with OBJ, Sharp Money is on the Browns plus three. You're now down to two at FanDuel, as you alluded to, Todd. Maybe it's a teaser leg at this point. How big, in your opinion, is the coaching advantage potentially that Cleveland has working in their favor? I mean, I know Zach Taylor early on has exceeded expectations. I mean, he's got to be considered as one of the coach of the year candidates, given this team had a win total that I believe closed at six and a half. Now, I don't think ultimately Cincinnati is going to be a 10 or 11 win team. And what Sean Payton is doing in New Orleans is nothing yeah. short of astounding. And let's not ignore the last time that the Cincinnati Bengals started a season five and three. They finished six and 10 and Marvin Lewis lost his job. But Kevin Stefanski, a little bit on the hot seat, not for his job overall, but to try and get this team rolling in the right direction, given all the expectations coming into the year. There were a lot of expectations. But what are you going to do when you get pummeled with the injury bug? And so I think a lot of the issues are injuries. Guys are playing through injuries. I mean, just think about the guys that are actually playing, right? Forget the guys that aren't there. There are guys that are playing at 60 70%. Baker Mayfield probably shouldn't be playing. And so I think that's ultimately the question. Do you go to a 100% case that knows the system or do you just kind of let Baker Mayfield trudge through this injury? Kevin Stefanski, obviously, won coach of the year last year. You wonder if some defenses are starting to figure out the system a little bit. It's not overly complex, and this is a division game. So they've seen this offense multiple times. Listen, I'm not a huge Zach Taylor guy. I think a lot of what's going on here, and you know, he is the head coach, so he's going to get a lot of the, the praise but 
this is a really talented team. I mean, you start to think about the money they've spent on defense and the talent they have on offense. I know the win total was six and a half, and there was a lot of sharp guys contemplating going under. But now that you start to see the weapons they have, number one overall pick at quarterback, a tight end that's emerging, and a defense that's spent the last two off seasons and has one of the highest paid defensive lines and secondaries, suddenly you're like, oh, this guy, this team's kind of loaded. <laughs> I mean, they're a couple of offensive linemen and maybe a head coach away from being perennial contenders, not yeah. only in their division, but within the AFC, uh, as, assuming you think highly of Joe Burrow, as I know you do. So awfully interesting team on a variety of fronts. Cleveland, though, clearly would need to pull off this upset to try and get things back in the right direction to allow them to chase some of their preseason goals. Payne, there was also another team that started out like a house on fire. Everyone was ready to send... Brandon Staley right to Canton, Ohio, given what we saw from the Chargers offense. But our man Warren Sharp has noticed a little bit of an issue with what's going on in Los Angeles amid their recent crash to reality. This is Warren Sharp from sharpfootballanalysis.com and NBC Sports Edge with your Sharp Stat of the Week. The Chargers offense is far from perfect. In fact, we pegged their new offensive coordinator as problematic before the season even started, and we've been speaking since week one about how this offense needs to be more aggressive on early downs. That said, sometimes it takes hitting rock bottom to realize you have to make a change. And that's exactly what happened when the Chargers, off of three straight wins, were destroyed by the Ravens and their complex blitzes the week prior to the bye. They vowed to make changes in multiple key areas, but out of the bye, with a less than 100% Austin Eckler sputtered, and Justin Herbert was once again confused by the great Bill Belichick. Now, the Chargers are all the way back up against the wall and must take on the Eagles on the road. But I think this is where the Chargers offense might be able to get on track because by nature, this offense simply tries to keep up with the sticks and the Eagles will allow that. The Eagles pass defense ranks fifth worst in wide receiver early down passes thrown within 10 air yards of the line of scrimmage. They're allowing plus 0.23 EPA per attempt, which is three times higher than the NFL average of plus 0.07 EPA. Only four teams in the NFL have thrown more of these wide receiver passes short on early downs than the Chargers this year, so it's in their wheelhouse. Additionally, the Eagles defense ranks 29th versus running back passes, and the Chargers offense ranks number three in running back pass efficiency. What this means is the Chargers can do what they do on early downs, such as short wide receiver passes and running back passes, and both should have ample amounts of success against this Eagles defense that has the lowest blitz rate in the NFL and doesn't really complicate coverage like the Chargers just saw with each of their last two opponents, the Ravens and the Patriots. You want to take a minor victory lap for the Chargers regression that you <laughs> forecast it was coming a few short weeks ago, and we've seen them put together absolute duds and losses against the Baltimore Ravens and, of course, last Sunday against the New England Patriots when their offense started hot and ground to a complete halt, maybe up until the end of the game, where they had a very important garbage time touchdown for both you and I. I No victory lap, but we identified this right after the Washington game because I remember that Monday morning podcast. You're like, Chargers were awesome. Look what they did. 14 and 19, 14 and 19, baby on third down. And so I started thinking to myself on the fly, I'm like, that's probably not very good if you're in that many third downs. And this has been an issue from the onset. We mentioned it even on last week's show, I believe, or the week prior where Brandon Staley was saying all of the right things and he was warming up to the analytics crowd and everyone who's got some votes for potential coach of the year. And he was saying all the right things. And nothing really changed. Last week, what we did see was them trying to throw the ball a little bit deeper down the field without success. Belichick was awesome last week. Came out, went zone, but it was a very ferocious zone. They were sending blitzes. They had a bunch of guys around the line of scrimmage, and you didn't know who was coming, and they dropped back. This week against Philadelphia, as Warren alluded to, Philadelphia plays a little different type of zone. It's more of like the Matt Eberflu style, which is, hey, we're not going to do much with our secondary. We're going to let you pick us apart four, five, six, seven yards at a time. So maybe the Chargers deficiency actually is a strength this week. You do have to monitor Justin Herbert's hand, hit it on a helmet late in the Patriots game. I think he will be fine, but something to monitor over the next day or two. Yeah, it's amazing how much can change in just a span of a few short weeks. Everyone thought the Chargers could run away and hide with this division. 
Kansas City being eulogized, and while the Chiefs haven't exactly been great, they're still very much in the thick of things while the Raiders deal with a laundry list of more off-the-field issues, and the Denver Broncos continue to pick up the rear after they traded the face of their franchise in Von Miller, hopefully looking to get better down the stretch. That's the NFL pain. College football had its first playoff reveal coming on Tuesday. Uh, and of course, no surprise atop the ladder when you're looking at Georgia number one, Alabama at number two, I think surprised some folks. And that's where the picture starts to get a little bit more muddled. So much is going to change during the course of November, but Michigan State and Oregon, if the season ended today, would be into the college football playoff. Oklahoma much further down the list, Cincinnati nestled somewhere in the middle. I mean, you brought up some interesting points uh, on the Wednesday edition of the Bet the Board podcast talking about the Bearcats and what some of those numbers could be. I think our listeners would be blown away to know that Cincinnati, not so far off when we're talking about that second tier of so-called elite programs. No, absolutely not. Now, let me ask you this, because I sure. hate to pass it back to you this quick after you've asked me a question. No one wants to uh, have a question answered with a question. That sounds like a wife-husband kind of thing, but... Who would you have made number two other than I Alabama? Talk to you. I do talk to you more than I talk to my fiance. So, you know, theoretically during football season, this is the healthiest relationship I can offer up. So I think the committee did the right thing with Alabama at number two because they didn't paint themselves into a corner because you know full well that if Alabama beats Georgia in the SEC championship, assuming they win out, they're going to be the number one overall seed. Georgia falls to number two. Meanwhile, if Alabama were to lose to Georgia, I think they're on the outside looking in. And from a full-on power profile, then yes, Alabama has to be there. But the area where I really struggle, and I do it every year, is are we supposed to get the best teams in? Are we supposed to get the most deserving? How do we find that perfect balance? So Alabama, by virtue of the one loss, I think a lot of people go, man, I'm surprised to see them there. But Alabama and Georgia are cut above everybody else. From a power yeah. standpoint, you're then looking at Ohio State. And then it's everybody else. The interesting thing about it, your Wake Forest of the world, your Oklahoma's, Every one of those teams, if they were to win out, will have a chance to play themselves into the mix. My biggest concern was with Cincinnati now because the committee doesn't value a potential win against SMU. It won't value a win against Houston. It's devalued the win at Indiana, which of course doesn't look better as the season progresses. But suddenly an 11-1 and Notre Dame team, I really believe has a legitimate shot in a chaotic end of the season to jump an undefeated Cincinnati team given the brand cachet that they could bring to the playoff. Not a chance. If Cincinnati wins out, the win on the road in Notre Dame outright trumps that. It has to. And we kind of talked about this Wednesday saying, what are we doing here? If this type of Cincinnati team can't get in, then just scrap the whole thing because exactly. they have cachet, right? You have Luke Fickle, a head coach, who is a hot commodity. If we see one of the Big Ten jobs open up, he's going to be the top candidate. You have Desmond Ritter, who is a name brand, especially at the G5 level, and you have two potential first-round picks on defense at premium positions at corner and, and pass rusher. I mean, Maya Sanders is fantastic. And I, I don't see a situation where if there's not some mayhem at the top that Cincinnati doesn't slide in. And the one other thing I said on Wednesday's show is we'd make Cincinnati about a two-and-a-half-point favorite on a neutral over Oregon. So it's tough for me to comprehend how a one loss Oregon team, and it's not really a very good loss on the road at Stanford, <laughs> is ahead of Cincinnati right now. Makes no sense to me. I understand yeah. you're valuing the win uh, on there the road go. at Ohio State, but like you did lose a game to Stanford, who's not very good. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because when you look in the way that Oregon lost that game, and they've been flirting with disaster in a number of other contests. I mean, there was a targeting penalty, there was an ejection, there was a touchdown as time expired. I'm not here to make a defense for Oregon. They'll have their work cut out for them going yeah. forward with games against Washington State, Oregon State, and a tricky little road tra trip to Salt Lake City to take on Utah. So if they finish 12-1, yes. and one, it's a much different resume than what we're seeing now. But you're right, with Cincinnati, I think this team continues to get discounted and you know they're being punished for the conference they play in. But no, when you look at that roster top to bottom, they shouldn't be mentioned in the same breaths as last year when we were talking about a BYU, even with an NFL yeah. caliber quarterback or a Coastal Carolina or Liberty. Cincinnati has been there, done that. They went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Georgia last year in a bowl game. Let's see if the committee comes to their senses and we get a little bit of chaos. But it's not just the college football playoff pain where you see teams going up and down every week. 
Our man, Brad Powers, who joins us every single week at this time, has a team trending up and a team trending down that you should be taking notice of in the college football ranks. To another week of the Powers numbers, where I take a look at one team going up and one team going down to most of my power rings for this week. We'll start with a positive. And this team has been bet on all summer and all year long by the professionals. It's the Western Kentucky Hilltoppers, who actually got off to a slow start due to a tough schedule. They started one and four, but losses were against Michigan State, Indiana, Army, and a really good UTSA team. Now that they're playing weaker competition in conference play, this team is winning and covering and winning with some margin. Western Kentucky, led by Bailey Zappi, the Houston Baptist transfer at quarterback, going up. And if you want to bet Western Kentucky each week, bet them early. They take money each and every week. Now to the negative side. We'll go with Arizona State. The Sun Devils fresh off an outright loss as a double-digit favorite against Washington State last week. And for me, with regards to the negative, it's just not on the field. It's also off the field. This is an Arizona State program that's dealing with some recruiting allegations. They had to get rid of a bunch of assistant coaches prior to the season. There's been some mishaps as far as communication uh, with the team, several uh, pre-snap penalties. Herm Edwards has mentioned it. And speaking of Herm Edwards, he might be on his way out. This is a team I don't want to be playing on the rest of the season. Arizona State going down, Western Kentucky going up. That'll do it for this week of the Powers Numbers. You know what, Payne? Brad might be one of the nicest guys in the space, yet every week he comes on with his segment and he fires shots right off the bow. Arizona State, of course, the team going down, much to the chagrin of all our loyal listeners, when we gave out our best bet on them against Washington State, a game that was over, I think, nine plays into it because Arizona State treated the football like a hand grenade. And uh, while I want to take umbrage with what he said, I'm, I'm not sure I can really argue with any of those sentiments regarding ASU being the exact antithesis of a buttoned-up college football team. Yeah, Brad could have saved us all some money if he delivered this sermon last week. I will <laughs> say this. I, the, th the three turnovers in 11 minutes, you're not going to win very many of those games. And you start to wonder if this is the time of season where some of those violations that Brad mentioned do come into play, but we've known about them since this offseason. And I know ASU got smoked on their win total under once some of those things broke in the offseason. But which team are we getting, right? Suddenly there isn't a problem with the violations when you're beating UCLA by 19, and then when you lose out right off the bye against Wazoo, it's a problem. So I, you know, it's tough to juggle this, and Brad probably has the best approach in just staying away. That said, <laughs> I think ASU you're gonna is going to do it, aren't you? I, I, I don't know if I can do it, but I <laughs> ASU is going to be the sharp side this week. We've already taken some money from eight to nine and a half. Would not stun me if it gets out to the key of ten. Well, I guess if one team's not buttoned up on one sideline and the other team doesn't know who their leader is as far as head coach is concerned, the two cancel each other out and you hope talent can ultimately be the difference maker there with Jaden Daniels outdueling Keaton Slovis. He also mentioned Western Kentucky. This is a team I talked about early in the year that I think is an extremely fun watch. They love to chuck it around the yard. Uh, and to Brad's point, they're playing inferior competition. And another side, to my knowledge, Payne, that's taken a little bit of money for their game this weekend against Middle Tennessee State. What's interesting about Western Kentucky, and I peaked right before we got on the show, we've made a 13 and a half point adjustment on their power rating since the beginning of summer. The offense is on fire, and you mentioned them kind of chucking it all around the park, and sometimes that has a negative connotation. Yes, they throw it all over the park, but they're uber efficient. They're number one in the country in productive drive rate, which is just wild to me. Now, Brad mentioned they took some steam this week. That is true. I think part of that is question marks at quarterback for MTSU. I know you kind of dug into that a little bit. Any any new intel there? No, not a whole heck of a lot. It's a team that's had an unsettled quarterback situation all season long, looked to have a little bit of stability in their performance against UConn, but still unclear in terms of who will be named the official starter. Uh, I'll say one thing about Blue Raiders football. They're not exactly great in terms of sharing information. They're not exactly great about getting coverage in the state of Tennessee. So unless you have a direct line into that quarterback room, it tends to be one of the more difficult programs, even amongst the group of five, to try and get a little bit of intel on. So should we get something, hopefully we can share it you know, as we get closer to kickoff. Makes complete sense. Also, I know we broke down the Bengals game a little bit earlier. Big signing this week, Vernon Hargraves, the Bengals. He's still around, huh? He's still, he's still a thing. Yeah. I, I feel bad for him because his, his dad was a coach and he is super technical. 
the problem is he was better than everybody because of that. And kind of once everyone got a little bit more talented, he struggled a little bit, but good kid. Hey, sometimes you can be mechanical and you can be technical, but athleticism uh, can oftentimes trump a variety of other areas. All right, into the college football game that we've handpicked, the only ranked matchup taking place on Saturday, and it'll go to Kyle Field where Texas A&M welcomes in the red-hot Auburn Tigers, Texas A&M fresh off of a bye. A four, four and a half, five-point favorite, depending on where you shop, the total hovering in the high 40s. Zach Calzada, Payne, he is the man to lead the charge as it looks like Haynes King will miss the remainder of the season. But when you're talking a and football, it's all about ground and pound and leaning on a defense that's finally rounding into shape, spurred on by that big win against Alabama a few weeks ago. When we broke this game down on the podcast Wednesday, there was a lot of Auburn fans that came out of the woodworks. They were not too happy. Apparently, somehow, what we said, and it wasn't an official pick on AM, we just kind of said the matchup wasn't great. They've been out in full force. There's another guy who's been commenting on the YouTube video saying 30 to 16 Auburn. I think we like Auburn more than just about anyone publicly. I believe they're seventh in our bet the board top 10 power ratings. I love everything that Brian Harson is doing. Give the guy credit. He's gotten players to buy in that he did not recruit. He's also got a quarterback in Bo Nix to turn things around in a couple months. That's something that Gus Malzahn couldn't do in multiple years. Give them credit. But a and a different beast. And their defense, to me, is one of the best in the country. We thought that coming into the season. They're top 25 in both rushing success rate and EPA allowed per rush. So is that three-headed monster of Bigsby, Jarquez, and Bo Nix going to be able to get going on the ground? I don't know, but I think this is a game where Bo Nix could struggle a little bit through the air. That's an AM AM secondary that has been fantastic. And when you've seen Bo step up in class this year against Penn State and Georgia, he has been a little bit different, 10% interceptable pass rate. And so I don't think he's going to be quite the passer we saw last week against Ole Miss. And ultimately, I think there's a reason why, Todd, when we recorded the podcast Wednesday, the line was three and a half some places, and now we're basically out to AM minus five. Yeah, this number has been on the move, and you can understand why, whether you make adjustments for the extra time to prepare with a head coach is polished with an an accomplished resume like Jimbo Fisher trying to get things going. There's also growing sentiment that Mike Elko, the Texas A&M defensive coordinator's name, will be bandied about for a lot of the vacancies within the state of Texas, especially as you see some of these college football job openings come online. And I don't think it should be understated either, Payne, when you look at these power conferences, especially in the SEC, how important it is to get that week of rest, that chance to hit the yep. reset button, even for a team that's only played back-to-back weeks, uh, as far as giving yourself a little bit of an edge, doing some self-scouting. And let's not kid ourselves here. These two teams with a little bit of help, Auburn with a more direct path, still have an outside shot of representing the SEC West in Atlanta as a division champion. They do, and I think that's probably the intrigue for a lot of Auburn fans is they think they're going to potentially run the table. And it's going to be a tall task. I think the other interesting thing, and you mentioned the time off and the preparation, and Knowing Jimbo Fisher being at FSU, he's always a guy that's able to get his quarterback improved gradually throughout the course of the season. So coming off this bye, I would think Zach Calzada looks a little bit different the way Jimbo coaches his quarterbacks. it's it's You're seeing improvement that we saw basically in every quarterback at Florida State. There's a reason a lot of those guys got overdrafted, and it was because of Jimbo Fisher. And so when I look at the way Texas A&M's offense is trending four straight games of increased production in terms of overall offensive success rate. And those have been some more difficult defenses that they've faced. Auburn is a good defense, but they are susceptible and a little vulnerable through the air just outside the top 90 in passing success rate allowed. I think you and I watched the Ole Miss game last week. And for full disclosure, both Todd and I were on Auburn last week. We don't have anything against Auburn. But when you look at Ole Miss's offense last week, nine of the 11 projected day one starters were not in that game. Yeah, that'll change the dynamic quite a bit. It will make even a mid to upper level defense look that much better. One thing I will say though, Derek Mason has done an outstanding yes. job making the transition from head coach at Vanderbilt, where he knew about some of his shortcomings to being one of the top tier defensive coordinators. Now, will this lead to him getting another job at some point? That remains to be seen. But I can tell you if Texas A&M is facing a deficit going into the fourth quarter, not the defense that you want to be playing from behind against, given how stingy they've been in some of those meaningful downs. 
every week on the Bet the Board podcast, Payne, we break down some of the biggest games. We share nuggets about some of the X's and O's, the matchups, the metrics, the markets, everything that goes into trying to make our audience more sophisticated bettors, whether they follow our best bets or they choose to go in a different direction. This show is the perfect place for that, and there's nobody better than to highlight some of the lessons bettors should be taking to heart than the crack man himself. Hey guys, Bill Krakenberger from crackwins.com and the Crack Wins app. Let's talk about the good old NFL. Before this weekend's debacle with the Jets, the Bengals won their last two games, which were both on the road, by 23 and 24 points. That also put them in first place in the AFC North. Then they go and face what many say were one of the worst teams in football, the New York Jets, who had a backup quarterback starting. This game was basically a one-sided bet for sharps and squares alike. They all bet the Bengals from the start of the week when the quarterback announcement came out right up until kickoff. The line moved from the Bengals minus 3.5 to minus 11.5 on Sunday. And as you all know, the Jets won outright, making this one of the biggest money makers of the year for the sports books. by the way. They cleaned up on this game. Let's move on. Detroit Lions. Here is a team that's just hard to figure out. Last week, they hung with the Rams in L.A. throughout the entire game. A few weeks before that, they battled the Vikings to the wire in Minnesota. And then we all know before that, the record-breaking 66-yard field goal by the Ravens to win as time expired. Listen, I just named three teams. The Vikings, the Rams, the Ravens. These are considered to be pretty good teams. I mean, very good teams. So this past week, in many of which many thought was a good spot for the Lions, plus three and a half point as a home dog versus the Eagles, they suffered their worst loss of the season, losing by 38 points. That's another line move. For, you know, for the, the best you could find, a kickoff was three. Two more big moves that went down the tubes. Indianapolis moving four points and losing outright. And all the sharps and squares alike getting sucked into betting Minnesota over Dallas on rumor that proved to be true, that Dallas quarterback Dak Prescott was not going to play. Another four-point move that lost outright. What's the purpose of all this? Well, I know I'm like a broken uh, drum when I always say any given Sunday, anything can and will happen. But I'm going to take it one step further. Don't be Joe Public and bet on a team at the climax of the line move. In other words, don't be laying three points when you could have had them a few days ago at pick them. Look no further than the Rams and the Bills last weekend. If you bet either one of these two public marquee teams on Sunday, you lose. However, if you bet them a day or two before, you at worst get a tie or probably even a win. Listen, it's hard enough to beat this NFL. So again, don't bet on a team where you're playing them at the worst number you could possibly get. Now back to my guys, Todd and Payne. You know, Payne, it's always great hearing that from one of the most respected voices in the space. And I'm not sure if it's buyer's remorse or if it's FOMO, but I can't tell you how many times people just want to feel like they have a winner. And if that's the side, they don't pay any attention to the price. And we see it in college football this weekend. I mean, Tennessee, Kentucky, it's a hell of a lot different if you're handicapping that game, thinking about taking Tennessee plus three, plus three and a half, versus if you're trying to make a case for Tennessee at a pick em. And to Bill's point, talking about those NFL games, it's the difference between a winner and loser at the top of the market in two of the biggest spreads that we saw on the board around non-key numbers. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And you kind of put this in context, right, about getting the right number, getting the best of the number, being able to beat the closing line. And it only really takes two bets out of every 100 for it to matter. And there's a lot of people that you will kind of see come into our mentions and you they say, you always talk about getting the best number, but most of the time it doesn't matter, right? Most of the time it probably doesn't matter. It only takes two times out of every 100 bets for it to matter. And that's the difference between someone that can't do this professionally and professional betters. Yeah, it's only it only matters when it matters. It's a lot different, obviously, and I don't want to oversimplify things. You know, if you're talking about a money line, whether it's a golf matchup or Major League Baseball, a nickel here or there for a lower stakes player isn't going yep. to drastically impact things in the grand scheme of things. Yes, get the best of the number. Don't lay a dollar twenty if you had an opportunity to lay a dollar twelve. So I don't want to try and bury the lead there, but it's definitely different. You know, for especially for a lot of the first half totals that we invest in. If you're going under 23 and a half consistently and we're going under 24 and a half, 24, uh, other than a missed extra point that happened to unfold in Tampa and New Orleans last weekend, there would have been a lot of pushes where getting the best of the number would have led you to the window 
with a winning ticket. And you know, normally Payne, this is the time in the show we go rapid fire. You tell me, I throw curveballs at you. I don't give you a heads up on what games. I want to give you the opportunity to pick a game or two that we didn't hit on that you feel our listeners will feel that much smarter about going into the weekend, whether it be pro or college. Well, what I'm going to do is I'll feel, do you want me to ask the question and then you can take it? Yeah, we'll see how I feel about well, that. Well, I can always throw it back to you. I can follow a question with a question. I just wanted nothing you to wrong come. With that. Okay, let's do this. I know the game's lost some luster, but Chiefs Packers. Oh, I knew it. Jordan I knew Love? it. You couldn't leave well enough alone. You couldn't get I'm through starting with Jordan show. Love. I so, didn't even mention that guy's name. Didn't even right, say we'll, his name. What do you make full? of Chiefs Packers? Now okay. that Jordan Love is in, we have seen the movement. We had Green Bay. It was minus one at some point. We're now out to seven and a half, coming down to seven. What side are you sticking on? I, I know you are a little biased. So suddenly the last two weeks, you're, you're off the Chiefs train, despite kind of banging the drum that the offense was actually performing well the first six weeks or so. What do you make I'm, of this game? I am not off the train. I said a quarterback who should remain nameless has taken the look and feel much more of the Texas Tech gunslinger he was during his collegiate days. Then he the just polished had a kid. He's been on the NFL. couch eating ice cream. Leave him be. <laughs> and he has the polished <laughs> NFL quarterback. Oh, uh, but you're right. This game is fascinating for a variety of reasons. Unfortunately, some of the wrong ones, uh, given the fact that we're not going to get to see two of the best starting quarterbacks go head to head like we thought at this time last week. So in steps Jordan Love, he'll make his NFL starting debut. And I think a lot of Packer fans on some level go, you know what? I guess if we have to give up a game in the middle of the season, we may as well see the face of the future in hostile territory. And we've already seen the market show some disagreement. I mean, we saw Kansas City in that two and a half point range on the look ahead number. They reopened minus one. You saw some shops flip Green Bay to a one point favorite. Aaron Rodgers gets ruled out and books went as high as seven and a half, eight. And earlier this week and even earlier today, you started to see all those hooks disappear. I think for the matchup, what I'm going to be most fascinated about will be seeing if Green Bay can stay committed to the ground game. Can they get A.J. Dillon and Aaron Jones going if Kansas City sells out to try and stop the run? I mean, you brought it up on, on our Thursday podcast, talking about Kansas City's defense is trending in the right direction, and we've seen it all the time for New England. You don't have to be good in September. You don't even have to be good in October. Make the tournament, be playing your best football when it matters most, and I think Kansas City is headed in the right direction. Now, for Jordan Love, uh, I'm at least excited that he'll be surrounded by some of his best weapons. It appears by all accounts that we're going to get Devonta Adams, we're going to get Alan Lazard, and we're going to get MVS out there. So let's see a short, controlled, methodical passing game because for Matt LaFleur, all of a sudden there's pressure on him as the head coach to get as much out of a backup quarterback here as what his brother was able to get out of a backup quarterback last Sunday in the Meadowlands. That is very true. What is interesting, and I'm I'm not trying to be the, the Chiefs homer everyone thinks I am, but you are starting to see some gradual improvement from the Chiefs defense. Six of the For last sure. eight quarters have been very good. Now, I know the competition hasn't been the best, and they got smoked in the first two quarters against Tennessee, but they were able to hold Derrick Henry to three yards of carry in that game. And if you're watching, right, the key here is A.J. Dillon, Aaron Jones, what do they do? But since week five, the Chiefs sixth in EPA per rush allowed. We've seen Willie Gay. He is back. Uh, hopefully the mental side of things uh, fix themselves because he is as talented as their comment linebacker. He's able to go sideline to sideline. Nick Bolton is a rookie. He's kind of learning some new things. They've kicked Chris Jones back. 